Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us a guest that has been a long time coming, who I've been desperate to have on the show, who I absolutely adore. We have Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist, Fox News contributor, author of Justice on Trial, the book about the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, which I have read, which I have enormously enjoyed. And the reason I really liked your book is because I feel, and I very much want to hear your thoughts on this, the Kavanaugh hearings were a great moment for conservatives to be red-pilled, by which I mean an understanding of the nature of who they were up against and any pretense that there would be any kind of sense of uh, fairness or decency from their opponents. Uh, fell away from any conservatives. And I, I would say, I think most people, why would you expect your opponent in general if they're trying to destroy you to be fair and um, magnanimous? Well, I think a lot of people had seen similar tactics deployed against other people who they thought maybe were deserving. Donald Trump being a great example, someone who uh, they thought really did have major moral problems. To see the same things being used against Brett Kavanaugh, a guy who seemingly... Uh, had kind of known he might want to be Supreme Court justice from a very young age and had acted like that. (laughs) Um, And just someone who was widely known as a thoroughly decent person. I think it did wake up a lot of people to this realization that it wasn't really about the individual or the merit of the claim so much as a political struggle. Well, it's also about the fact that that individual is, if they're in their way, they're going to be destroyed shamelessly and not, not just shamelessly, but proudly. Yeah, I mean, uh, there was that joke, and it really was a joke that someone had told at the end of this process where someone said, well, at least we destroyed Brett Kavanaugh's life. And I actually didn't mind it because it was this realization that that had been the cost of what had been done. People were very upset at this woman for making this joke. But um, yeah, it was very brutal. Uh, That woman is a writer on Stephen Colbert's show. And um, it's just fascinating when you realize how uh, the level of... um, the degree to which so many of these people are ideologues on these ostensible comedy shows and how this is such a mechanism for spreading a certain ideology. That was one of the things that my co-author Carrie and I were, Carrie Severino and I were trying to do in Justice and Tri- Justice on Trial was showing that this wasn't just about the Kavanaugh confirmation. This is really part of a much larger effort that goes back many decades. The battle for control of the Supreme Court is part of that. And it all relates to whether you accomplish your political goals through votes by the people or whether you use the courts to do it. And this really is a big debate that, you know, this did not start with the Justice Kavanaugh confirmation battle. So one of the things that I learned from your book, which was really kind of fun for me, is that a lot of this conservatives, at least would say, start with Robert Bork, that Robert Bork was qualified and they basically ran a smear campaign against him. The right wing at the time had no real counter campaign um, and they effectively scuttled his nomination. He would have been a strong conservative. Um, and now this time around, they were ready. But what I learned was the person who was probably most responsible individually for destroying Robert Bork's chance to get Supreme Court was Lawrence Tribe, who is a Harvard law professor, who I've spent a long time going after on Twitter in very uh, psyops ways. So Lawrence Tribe was the one who advised, apparently, the Democrats on impeachment. And I said, if this impeachment bl- blows up and is used to help Trump get reelected, how responsible are you personally going to feel? And the other point I made, and I want to hear your perspective on this, is the beauty of social media is that it shows the layman that this austere Harvard law professor isn't some erudite scholar in ivory tower, that he is a nasty, miserable, hardcore partisan who will do anything in his ability to make sure that his ideology maintains total control. And w- I'm so glad you pick up on this because Lawrence Tribe, yes, he was very involved in the Bork situation, but he'd been involved for many years prior to that. And this is something that the media would have known. He was uh, guiding senators through a strategy that took years to build up. Uh, it was about questioning processes in the Senate, their rules, their procedures. They came up with different game plans for how to politicize the court. And it was, you know, 
Armstrong actually kind of reported on a little bit at the time. Point being, the media would have known that he was this partisan activist, and yet he was always presented to the people as if he were this... Harvard Law. Yes, who was just speaking from a place of authority and petty political concerns were, were so far beneath him. And that was, you know, beginning in the early 1980s. By the way, I... One of the fun things about researching the book was finding these little tidbits. One of the things people remember about the Bork hearing is that Ted Kennedy came out immediately and gave a speech about in Robert Bork's America. And it's very well known among conservatives because they think that what happened is Bork was announced, Kennedy takes the floor shortly thereafter, this is all true, and frames him as a threat to an American way of life. And it it becomes their entire campaign structure. What I thought was interesting was when when Rehnquist was elevated to chief justice, he basically gave the exact same speech, and it was called in Rehnquist's America. Yeah. And so it was it was actually again part of this tribe influenced agenda and action um, strategy that they were following, and they were following it to great effect. Yes, conservatives finally wake up to it, but it takes them a while to realize, oh, we're dealing with a political operation. I mean, at the Bork time. There were people who wanted to go on and defend Bork, including members of his own family. And everybody decided that would be very unseemly. And now, of course, people are finally realizing, okay, if we don't fight back against some of these attacks, it'll just be over. One of the things I love about you is that you can dish it out as well as you can take it. So I'm going to ask you some little tough questions that are kind of that are asked on Twitter. Which is a bigger threat? Tongue and cheek questions. What's a bigger threat to America, Harvard or or ISIS? (laughs) Yeah, um... I actually think, what was the speech I was reading again, the Solzhenitsyn speech at Yale? Is that where it was? I don't remember. I don't in the know 70s? about this. Okay. Oh, it's really good. It's a really good commencement address where he's brought in, he understands so well the threat at the time that the Soviet Union is against the United States. But he also kind of starts talking about some internal threats that, that yeah. are there too. Um, you know, ISIS is a threat when we encounter them, and they certainly seek our destruction. And Harvard has some elements that also need to be guarded against. So. Fair, fair. <laughs> we all know what you just answered. Um, you, We just had lunch, and you were talking about, I said, say, let's save it for the show, the time we first met, which yes. was in the Fox Green Room. I, I remember meeting you, but there's something about, I don't remember our conversation per se, so I do want to hear about this. Okay, so I believe this was 2016. Okay. It probably was about exactly four years ago, a little bit more maybe. And one, what was interesting for me, I'm someone who, when Donald Trump first started running, I actually wrote things that were very favorable toward him. I thought it was kind of fun how he had these critiques of the Republican Party yeah. that needed to be made. But then as he started to do well, I completely freaked out. And I was <laughs> like, oh, wait, he might actually win the nomination. And he had all these ideas that I didn't have um, and didn't support. I thought he was a New York liberal. You know, I just did not think he should be heading the Republican Party. But I encountered a few people who made me look at things a little differently. And you were one of them. I don't know. So you don't remember this, but you were talking about him just as if he wasn't this existential threat to the country. You compared his run to the Oh my gosh, Schwarzenegger run yeah, in California. That's right. And somehow being able to think through, oh, okay, outsider, like kind of ridiculous character, but someone who might be needed for the state or the country or something. Or might just something. be shitty. Or just turn oh, out to be. Me, in bad. fact, I yeah. believe that's what you had actually said yeah. even, that like he wasn't as bad as people thought, but that he would turn out to be really bad as yeah. if he were if he were elected. Um, but you seemed so like, I don't know. You were just not freaking out in the way that almost everybody else I knew was. And it was just an interesting reaction that stayed with me. So. I remember in uh, 98 or 99 when I was you know, still wet behind the ears. And I was at some event, I forget where it was, and I was talking to some Republican Party operative woman. And I said to her, do you think America can survive a Hillary Clinton presidency? And she goes, yes. And it was such a matter of fact thing. And then there's that quote, there's a great deal of ruin in a nation. And it's like, if you look at what nations have survived, even if Trump were like 90% of what he's accused of, we'd still be America. Uh, this is a strong country with you know so many resources. And and I don't think he's come. So how has your opinion of Trump changed as, as from the candidate to the So presidency? around the time that I met you and you started talking that way, I, what I was really trying to do was just make sense of how it was possible that this guy who I thought just had no business running in the Republican primary could be doing so well. And I really made it and I made an effort to understand it. And another thing that happened around the same time, my husband Mark and I 
had a teaching assignment out in Michigan. So when we left Washington, D.C., everybody had come to agreement about the way to stop Donald Trump. And it was very simple. The way to stop Donald Trump was that every other Republican nominee should announce that if Trump won the nomination, they wouldn't support him. And then that would make the voters realize that they shouldn't vote for him. So you're still blue-pilled at this point. Right. So I'm like, okay, yeah, that, <laughs> that, that seems sense. to make sense. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so That's I go out to Michigan and I'm interviewing people. First thing we discover is that while Hillary Clinton is slated to win the primary out there, everyone we talk to is kind of friendly to Bernie and really not excited about Hillary. So that was a wake up call. Yeah. And, and by the way, Bernie ended up winning that primary and the, the switch between the last poll and his his win was like 26 points. Oh, that's no joke. Um, but we also were talking to people who were like, OK, so the plan is to get Republican politicians to say that if the Republican voters want someone else, that they won't <laughs> yeah. support him. Like, could you explain that again? And I would try it and they would be like looking at me like I was the idiot that I clearly was. And they were like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense at all. And I was like, oh, right. Why was I letting Twitter have any influence yeah. on my thinking? Because these are a bunch of people who couldn't reason their way out of a paper bag. Um, that has learning that basically learning not to take the groupthink consensus on Twitter seriously was such a gift for that campaign. And and from there on after. Anyway, I also just started talking to other people who were saying that they thought that the Republican Party had these problems that they weren't dealing with, that they had been allowing themselves to be controlled by people who really didn't have great ideas about some of the largest issues of the day, whether that's how we enter into war, how we fight war, whether we consider ourselves a country with borders and what that means, yeah. whether we believe in this too big to fail idea um, that corporations get to be bailed out and that it's okay that they get that big and that we bail them out and just whether like the economic system was working in a way that benefited everybody or just people who are connected to the powerful. And all these things I kind of thought of as heterodoxy and realizing that there were people who had been trying to make this case for decades and decades. And I'm not saying I was totally ignorant of sure. that. I know I knew that. But just again, having people who calmly said maybe it's good for for this movement to start thinking through some of these issues instead of just saying that if you don't believe in invading countries without a good reason, then you don't get to be part of this party or this movement. Yeah. One of the things I always, t like people talk about this war stuff, I'm like, if you care so much about our veterans, maybe sending them overseas should be your last priority. You know, like you're so desperate to put them in harm's way. This is not some, that's not intuitive to me. Um, and I'm delighted by how much Trump has normalized being skeptical of American kind of adventurism. It's probably worth remembering that when George W. Bush ran for the presidency, he claimed he didn't believe in nation building. Did I he mean, say this? Absolutely. He used the phrase nation building even. Um, and only did 9-11 change him from that. So it's really, you know, people say, oh, Donald Trump has this foreign policy that's very different from the Republican parties. That's true in the last 20 years or so, and really just different than the consensus in sure. D.C. from like Clinton era to, to what was just a few years ago. But it's actually not that different from what Republican foreign policy has been going back to Eisenhower. It's hawkish, but it's very restrained. It's like, don't make us come. Yeah. Don't make us come in there. But if we do, you're not going to like it. Um, and so it's not as different. It's just very different from recent memory. But I think, you know, Barack Obama won in part by claiming that he would very change from this policy. He didn't do it as well as he claimed he would in part because of who else was in the administration. Yeah, I, I think it's, and, and we, rem well, we don't remember, but in 76, when Bob Dole was Gerald Ford's running mate, you know, he had that debate and he said that the 20th century wars were Democrat wars and he was laughed out of office. But you look at the receipts, it's certainly unfair or historical to claim that the left has not had its share of warmongering um, when the opportunity arose. You know? Although I think the real problem, again, is not left versus right so much as when they work together. Like they work together to increase deficits. They work together to enter into war and not figure out a way to get out of it. It's really a bipartisan problem. Someone should write a book about that. Yeah. <laughs> so you, I, you did finish my book. And yes. I'm, well, I always use you as an example, often not by name, because I don't want to, okay. you know, where I'm like, I one of the biggest mistakes I had had in writing the book and since is how receptive conservatives are to being red-pilled and to being like, oh, this is what's really going on. And I remember very vividly 
because uh, you are uh, much more restrained than I am, I would say, much more kind of... It's a really low bar that you've just established, <laughs> but yes, I would say that. Well, that's the only one I can get over because <laughs> I'm 4'11". And when the Kavanaugh stuff was happening, you were tweeting in all caps, and I'm like, oh, we, we got Molly. Can you describe what that felt like to you watching it happen real time? And I also want you to talk about this going to be a long question. The New York Times recently tried to do it again after he was on the court and you single-handedly nipped that in the bud by getting a copy of the book ahead of time. Right. The New York Times had an article out for a day or so that led to every Democratic nominee for the for the, or every Democratic candidate for the nomination calling for the impeachment of Kavanaugh. Yeah. And the claim in the article was that there was another very credible allegation against this person. And people just went wild with it. And I had very providentially gotten my hands on a copy of the book before it came out. So I had read the, the basis for this claim. And in the book, they admitted, and good on them for admitting, these New York Times writers, that the claim, which was like a physically improbable claim about Brett Kavanaugh's genitalia making its way to a woman. Um, it didn't really make sense physically, but let's leave that aside. Sure. But in the book, they admit that the woman says she has no memory of any such incident. So someone else was making a claim about a woman. Um, and they also left out that the man making the claim had been a political enemy of Kavanaugh's going back to the Whitewater investigation. Wow. So leaving out these rather key pieces of information uh, did not serve them well. Wait, can I interrupt you? Do you have any doubt that this was done intentionally leaving out this information or did they not have access to it? I know it was intentional in part because there was an NPR. Oh no, they, they, the women who wrote the piece in the New York Times wrote the book. They knew the whole story. So the, the oh, other thing wow. is that the women who wrote the book um, were on NPR in an interview taped before any of this broke. So after they get in trouble for leaving it out, they claim it was an editing error. But before they got in trouble, they'd given an interview with NPR where they had a full hour to talk about whatever they wanted to talk about. And they told that story without mentioning either of those key facts. So it seems very deliberate, very intentional, in part because if you read the book, they didn't really have anything. And that was the best they could squeeze no, out of They it. do have something. They have your picture on a dartboard because you basically <laughs> ruined these women. We did murder that book. Um, yeah. And, but yeah, well. But I mean, do you ever think about, I mean, we both have interesting careers, but do you ever think about, holy crap, if I hadn't read this book ahead of time, this would have been months. So it... That's a big deal, Molly. It, Pat yourself on the back. No, it's it, it, it actually wasn't me, though. I mean, that's what's interesting. It is true that my co-author and I tried to get a copy of the book before it came out, and we tried every everything we could. Um, it was truly something where someone just managed to have it and said, would you like it? And we said, yes, we yes, would. Desperately. And so we both read it, and we also gave it – there were a couple copies, so we gave it to key people. Um, and yes, it was great, but I don't feel like it. it was just almost – beyond us like it was just a beautiful thing i mean yes we did try very hard to get it so no, I guess but what I'm, let me ask a different way you can very easily imagine a parallel universe where you didn't get a copy of this book and how this would play out i think and about to this that. day it would be why hasn't kavanaugh been impeached right yes yes well and also because you realize and you realize this because of your books um people don't read books yeah and so right. a lot of people will buy a book but they don't actually read it and we were interested in what it had to say specifically so we were really digging into it the vast majority of people who would have read it and that wouldn't have been that many people would not have even been thinking to pick up on that and so it's so interesting but i i think about it like uh the day after the 2018 election i did fox in the morning and then i took the acela down to dc and I just sat at one of those tables, you know, they're like the yeah, yeah. the four seats. And I'm like, that guy looks familiar. And I'm like, who is that? I know that guy. And then I see his name tag says Representative Gerald Nadler. And I'm like, oh, yeah, the guy I covered for like a decade in <laughs> Congress. Yes, that guy. Well, he lost a lot of weight. So to his credit, he's unrecognizable. Michael, yeah. that is why I didn't recognize yeah, him. Yeah, he lost like 200 pounds. It was really weird. I yeah. was like, and you know how sometimes you see someone and you go, oh, I know that person. And then you go, oh, no, it just looks like that yeah. person. That's the kind of thing I was yeah. thinking. Of. Okay. Anyway, for the entire three hours down to D.C., he proceeded to have loud conversations on his phone about what his plans were as head of the judiciary. Wow. Of, uh, head of the judiciary committee, including impeachment of Kavanaugh, impeachment of the president. And I mean, he was just letting it all out while I'm sitting right there. And I'm just, you know taking extremely good notes of everything. Do you type fast? I am an 
I am an incredibly fast typist. Okay. Wow. And I'd also started typing before he before I realized who it was. So I just went from doing my work to just starting to just transcribe everything. And um, at the end, I asked him if the person that he was talking to was this person I thought it wait, was. Wait, 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 no, 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 no. You're, you're yada yada the best part. So you have three hours of notes. Do you go up and introduce yourself? How, what's the icebreaker? So, you know, when you're pulling Bitches in... be texting, am I right, <laughs> Mr. Nadler? Like, what do you say? When you pull into the, into the train station, yeah. uh, everyone kind of gets up to walk out. So he gets up to walk out. And I'm like, okay, I have to, A, I have to let him know yeah. what I was doing. Because even though it was totally public and I do not feel I did anything in Please any stop. way inappropriate, I still wanted to let him okay, know. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We got to tease this out. We got an hour. This is, an, <laughs> it, this is like NPR, but, you know, not funded by the state. Um, are you full of adrenaline? Yes. Okay, are you nervous? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Th- and you're, a, you're a small woman. And I, I'm not, well, he's he's a wee no, well, no, but, he's a large man, but a wee man. Right, but too. what I'm saying is you're not like some, you're, you're, you're physically, so it's just kind of like. I'm not very confrontational, yeah. despite my. <laughs> Twitter. Despite what people think. <laughs> but um, I also had a theory that he was talking to this one person in particular, and if he had been, it would have been huge. Okay. So I wanted to, I wanted to get confirmation of that. I, so, I, I just feel like forgetting politics, if, if I or someone came up to me and said, Tap, tap, tap. Are you Michael Malice? I'm like, yeah, it's the streak in the hair. You know who I am. Well, I've just been listening to your three-hour phone call. I took notes and I'm about to report it. So quick question. And it's like, okay, where's my knife? So I didn't announce myself as a reporter. I said, was that person that you... Wait, would... you say, wait what'd you say? Hi? Are you Congressman Adler? No, I just, I just, I just said, were you... I said the na- the first name. I said that first name that you were wait, talking wait, no, to. No. How did you introduce yourself? Did you say did you say hi, Mr. Nadler? No, I just you said, just asked the question. I mean, we had been sitting okay oh, closer than I you see. and I so are he the saw entire you. Okay, time. got it. Okay. So I said that person, that name, that person that you were talking to. Um, may I ask who what his last name was? Now, if someone asked me this question, I'd say you're a crazy. Screw person. you! I'm not going to tell you. Yeah, who I was who are you? To. But he actually told me the last name it was not who i thought and he explained the relationship of the person and it was it 100 percent checked out and it was not who i thought it was and and um i said there's another barack <laughs> there's a second barack <laughs> hillary but yes um, no um and so i said well it wasn't w is was hw <laughs> i said i am i am a reporter and i i was you know listening to your conversations and he said you cannot report that last, like, you can't report what I just told you about the name. Fair. Well, it's, I think I would have had the right, like, I ag- yeah. but I, but I agree. I thought, well, this was enough of a, of a personal situation yep. that I will respect that. And then the next day or like a couple of days later, he's asked about it on CNN about this phone call that I did write up. And he said, like, you know, something like it's all lies. By the way, it all, it all has completely checked out in every possible way, given his yeah. actual actions in the intervening uh, year plus. But I thought, well, you know, I respected you enough to not put the name of the person in there. And I wish you wouldn't say I was lying. But well, what do you want him to do? Be truthful. I, I, in all seriousness, though, you think he could have been in like, yes, I intend to impeach Kavanaugh on President Trump? I would have Trump. said, Trump? you know, I would have just, I feel like politicians should be better at spinning things. And yeah, I would have know, said, she, she misinterpreted. What I was trying to say was we need this blah, blah, blah. You know, I, just reassert whatever you're I got you're an even better do. answer. I can't comment on personal phone calls that people think they overheard in public. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And that's not, that's not, and that's not really ethical completely. You know, yeah, that's a very fair answer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. Point being, though. Yeah, I agree provi- with you. How providential to just be seated there. Yeah. And it happens a lot. I don't know if it's a female thing or whatnot. I cannot tell you how many stories I've gotten by just sitting quietly in other people's presence. That's amazing. It's a great trick. It's my best reporting trick. So I got to interrupt you. Your book was a huge success. Mazel tov to you. Do you have another book idea that you're working on? I do. I think... If there's another opening on the Supreme Court that Carrie Severino and I would probably just write about that confirmation battle. Plus, now that we've done it already, we know kind of what to do while it's going on and what kind of notes to keep. And we know who all the shortlisters are and whatnot. So I think that might be the next in line. Did you interview Kavanaugh for the book? We don't talk about who we interviewed. We did interview many Supreme Court justices. Oh, because I said a lot of sources. Okay. I just, one of the things that I, reading the book, really, really upset me was when he, this guy, father, had to go on with Martha McCallum, who's, you know, very nice and honest, and had to talk about when he first lost his virginity. I was like, this is so 
gross. Right. It was bad, not even for him so much as like for, for us. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't mean for, I'm just, just like. Totally yeah. inappropriate. Although I do think that one thing that was interesting was if you think that there was just a planned operation to go against whoever was the nominee, in this year that that happened, a Me Too type thing was actually a pretty good smart strategy. And they managed to pick the one guy who had actually dated quite a bit and had good relationships with all of his exes, which is like unheard, unheard of. of. Yeah. And they all had in detail stories that matched his description of what type of person he was. You know, they would say like if they were changing clothes, he would turn around, you know, not in any way what they had tried to present him as and had the diaries to prove it or the calendars to prove that it. That so was I, amazing. So I imagine that when people realized like they'd picked the wrong guy, that they were just like, oh, yeah. We picked the wrong guy to run this operation I mean, against. By the time you're digging into yearbook quotes, you're really trying to. That well is dry. I did. I've read so many yearbooks as part of this uh, <laughs> book project. But like, I'm really impressed with, particularly the Holton Arms, the girls' school. Those girls were having fun. Oh yeah, good times, 1980s. <laughs> anyway, guys, want to take a second tell you about Ridge, which are these really cool wallets. If you go to ridge.com slash malice, you get 10% off your order, promo code malice. They take everyday goods to a standard you don't see every day. They're streamlining your life with these Ridge wallets, and they got their start and kickstart in 2013, just like I did. Mine was a little before then, but you know, you can't all be as cool as me. It looks nothing like a traditional wallet. It's two metal plates bound together by a durable elastic band. It's made of titanium, or it's made out of carbon fiber, or it's made out of aluminum. They've got a dozen different styles and colors. They've also got a lifetime warranty, if you love it, and a free return if you don't. No risk. Great gift for young people. Oh, I need a wallet now. I'm a grown-up. Don't get that crap at the mall. Go to ridge.com slash malice and use promo code malice. You get 10% off. And let's, oh, what's with your wallet? Yeah, it's this thing called Ridge. It got started on Kickstarter. You probably haven't heard of it. Yeah, you're going to look cooler than everyone in your office, which isn't saying much because they're all losers, let's face it. Speaking of losers, let's get back to my show. So I was very excited that you were reading my book because I just think you're the bee's knees. Well, um, that's nice. And <laughs> it is. I want to know what your biggest takeaway was and so, if there, it changed your mind about anything. Well, I, I, I'm really interested in like how people i'm re interested in the realignment i have seen the realignment going on since basically the time that we met like in fact it was i remember at cpac four years ago i said something to my husband like we're in the midst of a realignment yes. he was like i think that's overstated i was right um we are in the midst of a realignment and like i had had this approach with a lot of people on the right of not being that interested in what their underlying message like motivation motivation was okay and i found that part to be the most interesting and that you were able to like go in and actually go to these meetings and just be who you are which isn't really aligned with them per se right but you are honest about it with everybody and then they just kind of like open up and then you have this very libertarian sensibility which i think serves people very well of not freaking out no matter what anyone says yes so you're in the midst of some people who are very unsavory sure and yet you were like I'm not here to convince you that you're wrong. I'm just going to kind of hear what you have to say and try to accurately convey it. Yeah. And I think a lot of times these unsavory ideas like smoking in the boys' room uh, have currency because they're made taboo and risque. And then as soon as you talk to these people, A, their anger dissipates, and B, you can kind of uh, get them to kind of modulate their more radical views when the radicalism is unwarranted. Having said that, it actually kind of in some cases made me more concerned about okay. some of these people. Sure. Like, um, yes, sometimes when you shine a light on it or you just sort of like treat it like it's... Um, Matter of fact. Yes. Yeah. That can help... Mitigate. Yes. And sometimes... We should play taboo because we're sorry. good at this. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, this is really good. <laughs> but sometimes it also sort of, like it doesn't make them change their views. Yeah. And then that's a little terrifying. And there is that element on in this like sector of the right that you expose that has some viewpoints that I found like they need to be dealt with. Yeah, there's some 
genuinely bad people. And I don't mean bad simply because of their views. I mean, they do have malevolent intentions. Um, and I've got a plan that I'll tell you about off air. And okay. I love doing this to the audience because it's going to torture them. <laughs> and you are going to absolutely love this plan. Okay. The other thing I thought was interesting is that the, like, the book is called The New Right. Yeah. But not everybody you were talking to seemed that right. Who would you say? is? I don't know. I'm just saying it seemed more like the new right is so expansive. It literally means anyone who's figured out that the gatekeepers are not being straight with us. No, I don't, I don't think Tulsi people are right. Okay. I think that's your, what you're defining as red-pilled. Like okay. anyone who realizes that what we're perceiving as fact is in fact a carefully constructed narrative designed to keep some very nefarious people in power. That's right. But isn't that kind of what groups everybody together? No, I think right to me means uh, being comfortable with hierarchy as opposed to aspiring towards some sort of equality in any sense. So uh, when I was on Rogan, I have my litmus test question, which is how do you know if someone's right wing or left wing? Because people use these terms in different ways and this question works 100% of the time. Uh, if you ask someone, are some people, are some people better than others? Yes, right wingers say yes, left wingers give you a speech. Because uh, mm. they'll have cognitive dissonance and they'll start spurging out. So that's really the very way. Easy I did want to ask, what do you mean by better? But but, but then I would have been left knew. wing. Yeah, yeah. No. Okay. Right. So um, that's a very quick litmus test for right versus left. And I hate the uh, Dinesh D'Souza idea of like, well, Hitler's left wing because he's a socialist. It's like, no, no, there's right wing. Every every tribe has really bad people on their side. And if you want to define away the bad people to the other team, that's not intellectually honest, in my view. So I also have a weird question that I'm not sure is interesting, but... Well, this show, there's never been anything interesting on this show, so you're in the right place. <laughs> Editing. Like, how did that... How... Oh, it was a nightmare. Yeah, like, you sometimes seem to almost break down that wall of mentioning that. Um, I don't know. Editing. How did you take all of these big ideas and make it into like a really interesting to read story? And how much of that was your outlining and your direction and how much of that was other people like? Oh, that was all me. Um, I, I meant the editor uh, didn't get a lot of the book. Uh -huh. uh, at one point he said, I don't have the stature to criticize William F. Buckley, um, which is interesting given that Trump's on the cover. Um, and there was one really great point because this is a there's a this a, a lot of this has to do with Trump, right? They'll know not largely not exclusively. And he said, "I don't understand why you feel the need to constantly insult people." <laughs> and I was like, oh, "Okay, I don't, I don't really." <laughs> We're having a problem. <laughs> yeah, we have a problem. Um, I do think uh, the North Korea book, where I had to distill you know, 70 years of North Korean history into a coherent narrative that is also fantastical, really helped. And I think um, it also is organized like, this, I, I guess I've never talked about this publicly, it's organized like Dante's Inferno. So the, yes. the further That's, along okay. you yes. go, the worse the people are. Yes. And I think it's very clear where I feel the line is from like, I always say you take one red pill, not the whole bottle. And it's to me at least, it's clear where the line is like, okay, this is where you stop. And we can pull you back. Um, yes. And after that, it's like, you guys have You're, gone way too far. That is so helpful. So, Actually, that totally makes sense too. Okay, uh, William F. Buckley, I just want to mention that I know this guy who's a professor and he teaches conservative thought and like founding principles and whatnot, but he asks his freshman students if they know who William F. Buckley is and they never do. And if he's talking with older people about this, they always gasp. Yes. Like, how could you not know who William F. Buckley is? And he wants to say to them, like, what, why would they know who William F. Buckley yeah. is? Like, why, what, what need would they have to know that? Like, you are thinking about your youth where there were some important things happening. Yeah. But you, if you want to um, affect younger people, you have to kind of keep the victories coming and update the Yeah. When, he, when my editor said that, I immediately tripled down on my attacks on you're Buckley. like, well, now I really yeah. have to Because in, in the book proposal, I described it as having the wit and charisma of Stalin. And I said that he was like Fido desperately begging for table scraps from the left. That was his role as a court jester. And one thing you just mentioned just really was why I feel comfortable attacking him in very, very uh, personal and harsh ways is when Ayn Rand, who is a major figure in turning America toward the right and embracing capitalism, individual liberties, being skeptical of government, uh, when she passed away in 1982, his obituary of her starts, Ayn Rand is dead, and so in fact is her, is her philosophy. It was in fact stillborn. 
And I'm like, you are such a tasteless piece of crap. And we see it nowadays when people die as a political figure. And if, whether it's a right winger or a left winger, people are reveling on Twitter. And it's just like, you know, just give it like I will make the meme and make a joke about someone dying. But to spit on someone's grave while the body's still warm, they're, they're gone. They can't hurt you anymore. And to have this air of erudite, like, you know, class and to just be as despicable as that to me is was indicative of his phoniness and also when Rothbard died and he's and he had this obituary about Rothbard believed in liberty but David Koresh believed in God and and basically no one cares about Rothbard it's like I brought the receipts how many people follow Rothbard on Reddit versus Buckley or National Review how many people read Rothbard's no one reads God Emanuel anymore everyone's re- not everyone but many people read Rothbard and certainly Rand is is a powerhouse in the bookstore so this is what I I really uh, and also that he was so comfortable in uh, being racist and homophobic and pro the state. And then 20 years later, you know, pretend like that never happened. There was not a coherence to his ideology. Well, what if instead you thought of him? I mean, like you're you're saying that he presented himself as erudite, but really he was nasty. Yeah. But and I always think more about the issue that the nastiness kind of was not bad. Well, I, I'm all meaning, for nastiness. Meaning like... He was pugilistic with his ideological foes. It's why I get confused when people are upset with people being pugilistic now. Sometimes the same sort of Buckleyite disciples are very angry at people fighting sure. harshly. But I think, well, I remember Buckley having fun and fighting I agree. Harshly. That's Buckley at his best. When he's on these debates and he's got that little smirk on his face and he's got the yeah, one liners. you know that's, he's coming in. That's Buckley at his absolute, absolute best. And few people did it better than him. What I'm saying is he spent a lot of time attacking his own. And as you know, that's the lowest pit of hell in Dante. So, okay. I, I, I am a fan of Buckley, okay. so I feel that I, have a cop- I need to defend I'm going to say one more thing. I have a copy of Atlas Shrugged that I got him to sign when I met him. So, yes. Look, please so, the other thing I think is interesting is he's undoubtedly served a very important role of putting together a magazine. And conservatives are people who care about ideas, for better and for worse. Um, And he did such a good job of putting a lot of conservative thought into one publication. What I always have found interesting, well, there are two things I find interesting about, about National Review, a publication that I definitely read cover to cover for many, many years as a kid. Yeah, it's a great great paleontology magazine. um, One is how deciding who's in and who's out has always been part of its ethos. Yes. And to that motto, uh, standing athwart... You like that motto? No, no, no. I think it's interesting. Standing Standing athwart athwart history, history, yelling stop. stop. It's an accurate motto. It is truly how they perceive themselves and how they operate. Um, Sort of like, it's futile, but we're going to do our best here. Yeah, that's horrifying. Well... Sure. I, I'm, I'm more ecumenical about it. Like sometimes I like to just see what different people are doing. But when we started The Federalist, Ben Dominich chose as our motto, be lovers of freedom and anxious for the fray, which yeah. comes from a Calvin Coolidge speech on the Declaration. And that's how we like to think of yes. ourselves. We're lovers of freedom and we're anxious. Like we're happy to get into the fight yes. and we're happy to, or not, that's not exactly what's meant by the anxious, but point being, we understand the seriousness of needing to fight for yes. these things. And so, uh, and then also we don't, and, you know, this is something that I think angers some people affiliated with National Review. We don't consider ourselves like the policers of who's in and who's right. out. I've written for Federalist. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've we've gone far in multiple directions. It always confuses people. Like they think that if you publish something, that means that's your editorial position. It's like, did you notice that we had like three pieces on the topic and we just want people to kind of test their ideas yeah. and fight it out? Um, so, but there, it is undeniable that he was influential and important for the conservative movement's self-conception. And, you know, I think that a lot of what they did was really, really good and important. I think maybe they should have or would have done things differently if they'd thought through the ramifications of some of their policing and how that was handled. And I got to interrupt you. Your book was a huge success. Mazel tov to you. Do you have another book idea that you're working on? So... I enjoyed writing the Kavanaugh confirmation book with Carrie Severino, um, and it was just interesting to get into that world. And so one of the other things that I thought would kind of meld two interests is to write the story of Attorney General Barr. Yeah. He's a guy who had previously been Attorney General. He's Attorney General. Again, um, he's deeply involved in trying to hold people accountable in some fashion for this Russia collusion hoax that was perpetrated against the country. And I just think that would be really interesting it's a complicated story to tell the Russia story. So I think it would be kind of fun to tell it through 
a person who's as interesting as Attorney General Barr. Let, let me ask you this. Uh, Grassley, when Julie Swetnick and Michael Avenatti had these ridiculous allegations that a Kavanaugh was present at these gang rape parties, not even that he was doing anything, he was just there. Um, Chuck Grassley, who's uh, chairman of the uh, Judiciary Committee, was like, he forwarded uh, with recommendations for further investigation, Avenatti and, and Swetnick, to the Justice Department to be like, these people are just, this something needs to have consequences. A year later, he sends another letter, like, what happened with this? Mm -hmm. Do you have any information about why this I, went nowhere? I do. So, yeah, there were actually several criminal referrals. None of the people who perpetrated false information in the Kavanaugh thing have been held accountable. Right. Um, there were several criminal referrals. That's just one of them. And nothing has been done on it thus far. And partly that's because when you make a criminal referral, it goes to a typical bureaucrat who has a lot of authority. So oh. for someone who's a political appointee to come in and say, hey, by the way, you did that thing, or you know, you, you got that information, what's going on with that? That would immediately become a New York Times, Washington Post story about how Donald Trump is trying to control the Justice Department. Yeah, yeah. And so they kind of, I think, pick and choose when they actually wield their political authority. Of course, we know, our Americans should know, that you need political oversight of bureaucracies. That's a very constitutional idea that our government is accountable, that our that our administrative state is somehow accountable. But every time they do anything, even if they just ask, like, what's the progress? It becomes a big story. So I think nothing has been done in part because they are aiming elsewhere. That's horrifying. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys, want to take a second to tell you about real, R-E-E-L, paper. If you go to reelpaper.com and use code MALICE, you get 20% off a single purchase or 10 bucks off your subscription. And it's free shipping on every order. What is it? This is awesome. It's incredibly soft, three-ply toilet paper delivered straight to your door. And it's super soft and it's durable and it's made entirely out of sustainable bamboo. No trees are getting knocked down so you can wipe your butt. Even the packaging is sustainable, but who cares about that? What I care about is that it's three-ply toilet paper made out of bamboo that's soft, which means, objectively, you are better than all your friends if you use real paper. If you go to reelpaper.com and use code MALICE, 20% off, just try it, free shipping. Not only that, they do something cool. Uh, for every old toilet paper you buy, real helps people in need get access to clean toilets. You know, 2.4 billion people don't have access to safe toilet, and they want to bring that number down to zero. If you go to reelpaper.com, use code MALICE, free shipping, 10 bucks off your first subscription box, 20% off a single purchase, three-ply bamboo toilet paper. Let's get back to our shitty show. Don't dispute, I think, most of what you said. I think that James Burnham, who I mentioned in the book heavily, is one of the greatest American thinkers on the right, and Buckley gave him prominence in National Review. Um, I do think that I remember very vividly, I was an intern at Cato in uh, 97. And they were, at the time, this was right after the Gingrich Revolution, and people thought the Republicans were going to shrink the size of government. Understandably, it's been 40 years since the Republican Congress. And Cato had published something called the Cato Handbook for Congress. Mm -hmm. And it was this big spiral bound size of a phone book. Like here's where you start. Yeah. And these are cuts you can make that's not going to really hurt anyone, right? Mm -hmm. And the, uh, David Bowes, who is, who's currently executive vice president, I think he had the same title back then, gave an interview. I, I don't even remember if I mentioned this in the book. And he said, this is like pornography for Republican staffers. We know they're not really going to do it, but they read it and get all excited. And I go, I sat there even at the time as a kid, and I'm like... You're putting all your effort into a plan that by your own admission has no possibility of being implemented. That to me is almost deranged. Um, and to, to, and again, to stand athwart history yelling stop, we're going to stop it. So you yell all you want, but I'm going to do what I can to affect this change because I do think the enemy, and I don't mean the left, I mean it's a certain subset of, of just politics in general, are very, very evil, dangerous people. So I th I think that the way Putin handles his government, where he has in place some systematic opposition, people who publicly are technically opposed to him and his agenda, and he gives a certain amount of power to these people so that they can kind of function as a release valve. He can keep sure. tabs on them. They benefit. They get some power yeah. and money and like tapping into the system. The Buckley Party. But they don't in any way, they don't pose a threat yes. to him. And I think that 
there have been many elements of conservatism that were content to be the systematic yes. opposition and play their part. And the way you see that now, I think, is so interesting. I always think if, if I'm being used by a political opponent, I should be checking myself. Yeah. And so you see in the post-Trump era, in the broadcast media, they're very, or cable media, they're very limited slots for that like huge half of the country sure. of who are not <laughs> leftists. And how many of those slots go to people who are never Trump? And so you look have to the, kind of think through Look at the why. view. The, the person on The View who is the closest, I would say, to being pro-Trump is Meghan McCain, who Ab- made a point to attack Trump at her dad's funeral. It is not even close that she is the most pro-Trump. Yeah. Like, she's the only person who is. And she and that they put on her this, like, responsibility to defend the tens of millions of Trump yeah. voters when she has a very personal reason to not be, you know, Understandably, that way. yeah. It's, like, amazing and unthinkable. Um, but, like, there are cable outlets where all of the right of center positions are held by never Trumpers. I mean, that's, that's unacceptable. It is, accept- but that, this is your, this is you're still being a little blue pilled. Why would you expect them to right. act differently? Right. I don't anymore. And okay. that's, I think what would that, so the whole beginning of this was you were asking about like Kavanaugh when yeah. he started using all caps. And I would say, I have been aware of the way media control thinking on certain topics since I was a kid. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Mainly, I just remembered thinking about how they talked about abortion. The language yeah. was all framed in support yes. of one position. The stories they would choose to tell were all supportive of one position, um, both ways. Like, if it makes a pro-lifer look bad, we'll tell that. If it makes pro-choice movement look good, we'll tell that. Um, and so I was aware of that, but I kind of thought these problems rose out of ignorance. And at some point, you have to realize, like, the errors are all going in the same direction. And they've been aware for, oh, there was this uh, McKay Coppins piece in The Atlantic about how, uh, you know, sort of like Republicans or conservatives are weaponizing media bias. It's like, <laughs> well, I think they figured out that you don't care yeah. about getting better. So they finally woke up to it. Like, they know that you're not, you're, you're doing this on purpose. It's not some accident and that they can convince you to be more fair. At some point, after many, many decades, you kind of wake up. If there's one group that should be informed about the media, it's the media. It's their job to be informed. So They when the- are the most powerful people and there's no accountability for them. Sorry. What no. Why are you saying sorry? Because I wanted to hear what you had. No, I, I was one of the things I had. To, let's let me ask you some more tough okay. questions. Mm-hmm. I had tweeted out. Do you agree that the healthiest thing that the right wing could do is to purge all the people who said Kavanaugh should step down? I think in general that this, okay, so if I can take like a slightly different topic, I think one of the things that was interesting about 2016 was how many people who were in the establishment said, we're keeping lists, anybody who enabled Trump is on that list and you will be punished. But then when Trump won, they were like, can you believe some of those people are angry at us right now? Yeah. (laughs) I was like, I think I can believe it. I think maybe they had legitimate reason. Um, And then more recently, when Bernie Sanders was thought to maybe be on track to get the nomination, some never Trumpers were saying that they would come back and vote for Trump over that, I think. Or maybe there was discussion that some might. And a lot of people were like, N- you're not welcome back yeah, after we what you've you. done. And I think that there is this issue where the Republicans conceive of themselves as a big tent party. And in many ways they are because of their historical three-pronged stool and whatnot. Yeah. They no- kind of know how to get along with people who don't share their views. Very fusionist. You can have a crazy libertarian and a crazy conservative who work any, together. Any port in a storm. When you're the small minority, <laughs> you've got to take in anybody. But I think there is a question about whether at least parts of that group weren't keeping that party from success. And I think foreign policy is a great example. A very unpopular, like crazy interventionist foreign policy where people were entering into wars without any exit strategy whatsoever, or even like an idea about how to win or an idea about whether this served the national interest, really dominated the party and was keeping it from having victories. So I think it's okay to push out some people and say, no hard feelings, but like you're just you're just not one of us. Yeah. Um, and so with the Kavanaugh thing, I do think there were people who showed a lack of courage yes. and sense. It was a, unfortunately a lot of people in the establishment. Yes. Um, and so I keep on remembering, and partly yes, I was covering this. I'd been covering it all summer, so I kind of was clued into what was happening with Kavanaugh. If the moment that those allegations came out, you didn't think one. 
I was waiting for this. Yeah. Or something like this. Yes. And two, are they really going to do the same thing as the Clarence Thomas playbook? Or are they going to, is it going to be different? Like you should have already been thinking, you should have been expecting it. And you should have been thinking this is very similar to something we've seen before. But on, you know, there are these like um, lists that people are on where they discuss things. And I was really surprised by how many people who I would have thought would have known better were like, gosh, this sounds very serious. I think I think this is a big problem. It's like, really? Uh, the one I am, I'm, I'm going to ask you what gets you outraged in a second, because this is what gets me outraged. Uh, as someone who's Jewish, as someone who does a lot of work with totalitarian governments and, and their horrors, uh, we were told not that long ago that unless we go into Syria, the Kurds were about to be the victims of genocide, imminently, imminent genocide. And we have to do this. This is not about right versus left. This is humanitarian. We're talking about the extermination of entire people right before our eyes and we're sitting our hands. That did not happen. And the Kurds, as far as I know, have not been wiped from the face of the earth. None of those people who were advocating for boots on the ground in the name of they wouldn't sometimes they even use the word the holocaust or any other genocide have had any consequences for this that to me really gets me outraged and this is how you know when a soviet's outraged when they have the calm face because that's when they've got the knife ready behind you like ivan drago what makes you outraged politically okay i would like uh, is to that, think about I've got, that that's got to be one though well i would say even though i didn't agree with the idea that that we needed to invade syria because of this issue, it's still a little too early for me to get outraged by people who made other predictions. Okay. Because I think it's fair. maybe this genocide that they assured us would happen, no question, maybe it'll happen okay. you know, in the coming months. So okay. That's, well, we'll let's, to, hope, let's hope not. Let's that hope is, not. Oh, yeah. 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 I don't mean to be like cavalier about yeah. it. Yeah. But in general, that issue that whenever there are threats of war or, or there's um, growing tension between our country and another country, that they bring on the same people who oh, yes. were so wrong about all the other previous wars. That bothers me. Um, I get why they do it. There's like a safety. They kind of know what they're going to talk about. And then, of course, they share their political views and whatnot. But um, that outrages me. I would say I continue to be outraged about the presentation of abortion, which I think is a very complicated and important topic that has always been covered poorly. And for me, you know, you say I was all caps during Kavanaugh, but I was really all caps when the Kermit Gosnell trial was yeah. going on when, you know, there's just no question that that's newsy. Serial killers are newsy. We yeah. as a country really enjoy reading news about it or we're horrified by it. It dealt with immigration issues and racism and health policy and drugs and like all. And, and, and that's on top of abortion, which is a very hot button topic. And there's a documentary about Gosnell, which was directed by Nick Searcy, who's a buddy of mine who's been on the show as well. Yeah, it's actually it's actually a movie, but based on the oh, sorry. true story. Okay. Yes. Um, that... And, and really well done for like, particularly like on a budget. And I think they must have gotten people to really give of themselves yeah. in terms of the screenplay is really good. The acting is great. Um, it was obviously production. a labor of love. Yes. Yeah. Um, really enjoyable as insofar as what it, the topic is. But seeing the way that the media just pretended like they had legitimate reasons for not covering that when we all know that the reason they didn't cover it is because it made their political side look bad. That That was a big moment. The other thing... Well, you're asking about what gets me angry. I actually don't get angry very much. So, um, oh, so next time I see you in all caps, I'll know. I'm going to slide to the DMs and be like, "Aha! This is one of those moments." No, I, I, I get very angry. What about impeachment? Did that get you angry? Oh, no. Because you were like, "Oh God, this is ridiculous." It was. It made me angry that we were expected to treat it like it was a serious thing. Okay. Yeah. But no. Like, I already want to know what the next impeachment is going to be. About. I, I remember. And there, hopefully it'll be better. I was covering some bill on my other show, Nightshade, and it had passed. I'm sure you know which one I'm talking about. Is either North Carolina or South Carolina, some pro-life bill, not that long ago. And the article explained what the bill would do. And there was a quote from a Planned Parenthood person saying why the bill is a bad idea. But there was no explanation oh. the pro-life side. And why and I'm would, sitting why there, would you find out what they're thinking? And I'm like, I want to know why they passed this bill. I can understand this criticism. Okay, this makes yeah. sense why this is wrong. What's the reasoning other than I want to control women's bodies? And there's not even a pretense of presenting it. This was Yahoo News. So, and I'm like, wow. 
the Los Angeles Times had this guy who I, bl- I believe was personally pro-choice. I forget his name. I want to say Shaw, David Shaw, who wrote an analysis of the media's coverage of the topic in like 1991. And he was like, we have serious problems with how we cover this issue. We're not being fair. We don't even offer quotes to people to explain their position. We just dismiss it as ridiculous and whatnot. And that was 91. So when you say like, why would you expect things to be any different? I get it. Like we're, we're not dealing with people yeah. who are operating in good faith, frankly. I got to interrupt you. Your book was a huge success, Mazel Tov to you. Do you have another book idea that you're working on? Okay, I have this idea that I think would be good, which is basically like looking at the realignment on the right, looking at the ideas that are really taking root among particularly younger people on the right, um, just kind of presenting that information to a populace that really doesn't understand. Uh, There's a lot of people who have been... Uh, they have decided that the conservative movement isn't meeting their needs and they want to um, they want to kind of bust things up and they have really interesting meetings. They have really interesting organizations. They have um, groupings that I think would be interesting to cover. So I would just like kind of embed, burrow in, go in and, and cover them and write about what they're talking about and what motivates them and their ideas and how they're being treated. And uh, Sounds boring as f- to be honest. Guys, Michael Malice here. want to tell you about Vessi. The smartest sponsors are the ones who send us stuff to try because then I can speak from experience. Vessi are 100% waterproof, weatherproof knit sneakers. They're made of Dymatex, which is a dual climate knit material. It regulates the temperature. Warm in the winter, lets, you, lets heat escape in the summer. It's very stretchy. They sent me a pair. I got the weird ones, which are the burgundy and cream. They've got the basic ones. They've, if you go to vessifootwear.com slash welcome, you get $25 off your order, 25 bucks off. These are my gym socks, gym sneakers now. What I love about Vessi is they're unusual enough that they look cool, but not so unusual that people are like, what are you wearing? That's the exact sweet spot to look hip in my view. Or you want to look like a weirdo like I do, you can go to the extreme ones. If you go to vessifootwear.com slash welcome, and use code WELCOME at the checkout, you get 25 bucks off. It's patented. It's vegan. It has a grip for all weather. And let's get back to the show. Um, I have a question for you. As someone who's gotten much more receptive to the pro-life perspective, and I know this is going to sound like, why do you, do you still beat your wife? But in my experience, the pro-life side has been very bad at being empathetic in terms of understanding people who are pro-choice. Like being a New Yorker, you're gonna be culturally pro-choice because you're not gonna have exposure to the pro-life perspective. So I would at least give people a hearing. But if I'm on Twitter and it's probably not the best place, all I hear is, well, it's a, it's a heartbeat, so the end. I'm like, it, it, it's 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 not to me that simple. Do you have, do you see, what was your best way to convince someone to be more pro-life? I don't, I don't actually know the answer to the question Okay. Because I don't think it's something that you can like convince people in in debate with. Okay. I will say that when I was covering Gosnell, that was the only time I have ever gotten emails or notes from people who were really wrestling with their pro-choice stance and open to it, or even it, or even saying that this they thought this had turned them from being like mildly pro-choice to self-identifying as pro-life. Um, so. I think that a lot of people care about this issue so deeply and they think that they can reason people into it and they think, well, certainly if we explain that this is a human life, then people will understand that you cannot dehumanize this group of people to commit violence against them. But like actually it doesn't work that way. And I think, but but I would say there are so many millions upon millions, well, billions of people who are pro-life. They're all trying to do it in different ways. And what's more interesting to me is like the movement keeps going having some success and just constantly being willing to try different ways. Like there are huge debates between people who are like, well, you can't reduce abortion without like conceding some part of the debate to the pro-choice side. So we can never, we, we you know, we have to be all or nothing. Um, there are people like that. There are the people who are like totally willing to just move the date back and back and back and different states try different things and they end up being successful. And it's just, it's a movement that just seems to be unflagging 
from like the moment they realized that they needed to do something, which was more than 40 years ago, 45 years ago. Um, and it just keeps growing. But I think they're, I think they actually are pretty versatile, just not probably on Twitter, which is Okay, that's fair. I, I, I mean, I also can't wrap my head around the argument that a, a nine month old uh, child, that that's not murder. If, if the fetus is viable, just because it's inside a womb, that, that you could do whatever you want to it just seems deranged to me. But isn't it interesting that you're actually seeing that be like the margin of the debate right now? So you have, you know, this is something that's been going on again for a while, this idea of like, if if a child is born during the abortion process, does he or she have a right to life? Is something you would think wouldn't be much of a question, but it actually is a question. And that um, the abortion rights movement, as they call themselves, would say that you cannot concede that ground without it being used to restrict the right to abortion inside you know, what they call the right to abortion um, during the period in the womb. So you have people openly embracing this idea that you should be like not compelled to provide care to a child who's born from abortion. The Gosnell situation, by the way, was one where he was doing abortions that were resulting in live births, which does happen not infrequently for late term abortions. And that was why he got charged with some of the murders. I, 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 I am desperate to understand this perspective because I so hope it's not what it seems like to me. Uh, Cause I, I, I don't get it. If this is, if, if, if a child can survive on its own, it's a human being that there's no dispute here to me. Well, not about, well, no child can survive on its own. No, but but I mean, birth. like it's breathing on its own, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it, you could take it home from the hospital. Right. And, that was what one of the testimony, yeah. the testimony in the uh, Gosnell trial involved someone talking about the baby being big enough to walk to the bus stop. Yeah. Like it was a big baby. It's that like, was... what, what do you, what do you, and it's crying, you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I guess we're on, I, I, I was hoping that <laughs> it's, uh, uh, we could change the subject. Let's talk about something more fun. Um, do you agree with my quote? that the corporate press is the enemy of the people. So I don't love the phrase enemy of the people. Oh, I, I thought you were going to say you don't love the phrase corporate press. Good. Okay. No, I, I, would, <laughs> I actually do want to talk about the phrase corporate Let's press. Let's talk about um, it. So I just want to say quickly, I love our constitution and I love that we secure freedom of the press. And I get worried. Our laws are very good supporting the press, but I worry about a culture that does not also support it. So even as someone who's very opposed to what has happened to our corporate sure. media, yes. um, I still get nervous about the phrase just because I want people to really support the notion and the right. Okay, fair. Okay. It, some, sometimes they make it difficult for me to even say that, by the way. So I like the phrase corporate media. I think it's a very I, – I hate all the other phrases. I hate mainstream. I hate liberal media. Lamestream. Lamestream. Well, all that stuff. <laughs> I hate it when people do those things. So I like corporate media, but I've gotten some pushback from people when I have used it. By the way, did you notice the attorney general used the phrase corporate media recently? Did he? Yeah. Excellent. I meant to point that out to you. I did not know um, that. So I like it because to me, it's it's actually just fair. Yeah. And yet also conveys that they are powerful and that they are operating on behalf of certain interests. I also like it because it's not partisan. Right. And lefties historically have been distrustful of corporations. And this is my way to reach out to lefties. So one of the push one of the people who's given me pushback on it thinks that since they are operating so people used to also say um the media are the are the pr wing of the democratic party no. well clearly the media run the party the democratic party yes now. they are the ones who pushed them to do impeachment when nancy was like this is a bad idea and they were like you're gonna do it yes <laughs> you're gonna do it now nancy yeah i made um, this point on reuben yeah so they clearly control the party so anyway so one person said why don't you just call them the democratic media but that sounds to me a bit much yeah, they're going after Bernie and Tulsi, shamelessly. And it doesn't explain how they yeah. control, they're the establishment. Yeah. Maybe like corporate media, no, how about um, liberal media complex? No, you're not going to, you're not going <laughs> to be open to anything other than is, corporate media. Wait, you really think liberal media complex is better? I don't. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm frustrated by how difficult it is to convey what we're dealing with. But like... I had this image of how cool it would be. Do you remember Manu Raju running down a senator to ask her some like totally tilted question about oh, yeah, like she's why like, she would I'm not talking to you. This is the senator like, from Arizona, whatever her name is. McSally. McSally. McSally, yeah. And she called him a hack. Yeah. I was thinking, and then she made t-shirts. What we really should have are 
other media who are running down Manu Raju going, why did you ask the question that way? Why don't you ever ask something like this? Why don't you like, why did you avoid this phrase? Why do you do like, why are they not held accountable? Nobody ever asks them questions. And they're in this like preserved space where have you not seen my Twitter? Do you know what I do to these people? I say to them, have you ever considered the possibility that you're one of the bad guys? And just ask, because the thing is, if you have even a bit of humility, right. you're going to be a lot less aggressive. Because you'd be like, you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. Let's right. let's hear Martha McSally out. Then I'll call her a dumb conservative or whatever after. But let me give her a chance to talk. This is a senator who's certainly going to be informed about the issues. So right. yeah, but they're, they're uh, I call them jihadis without the testosterone. I mean, they have an agenda. They will destroy anyone in their way. And we see, here's another example I recently used, which, you probably, which I'm sure you'd agree with, which is when you have these cadets playing the circle game, which is like hide and seek. It's, and they're playing oh. it. These are cadets, right? Young men and women playing like punch buggy. Headlines literally said cadets appear to flash white supremacist symbols. Those were the literal headlines. Biden, as a joke, makes a John Wayne reference and says, hey, you lying dog faced do uh, pony soldier, whatever it was. And the headline said, Joe Biden makes obscure John Wayne reference joke. So when it's Biden, you're explaining what it was, and when these these ch young p men who are serving the country, not that I'm Mr. You know, Army here, they're like, oh, maybe they're Klansmen. This is evil to me. And they've done it yes. over and over again in a way that is hard to distinguish from propaganda. Yes. So that other thing of how in Soviet times you would read the paper to try to discern right. what the truth is. something yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I was thinking about how weird it is that we know the name of the whistleblower, not because it was reported, although it was, it was reported in an established media outlet. We know the name because you're not allowed you to say it. You mean Infowars? No, <laughs> it was, it was uh, I don't, I have not, I'm not familiar with them, um, but it was reported at Real Clear. Okay, and, oh wow, and, very established. And, but so we knew it because of that, but the real reason we know it is because you're not allowed to say it. Yeah. That's crazy. And including the Supreme Court Chief Justice forbade a mention of it on the on the floor of the Senate during the impeachment trial. And when Rand Paul put it on a board, everyone whited it out like we were truly like we're just erasing that that yeah. didn't happen. I mean that's a that's terrifying. It's here's why it's not terrifying. Okay. Because 30 years ago we wouldn't know the name. And now, because do you know what the Streisand effect is? Yeah. So because of the Streisand effect, let me explain to listeners, Barbara Streisand <laughs> had a house, a beach house. Mm -hmm. and, in Malibu. In Malibu. And someone put it somewhere. They pointed out some minor blog. She sued. Because this lawsuit, it got a million times the publicity. Same thing with EC, the whistleblower. It's mm -hmm. that because his name was mentioned, like people, thanks to social media, now are putting it everywhere simply for the purpose of saying screw you to these ostensible censors. YouTube was pulling videos that mention his name. It's I didn't want to know his name, but now I do. Well, the idea that you couldn't know the identity or name of a person centrally involved in an effort to remove a sitting president is scary. And it's not just the name, it's like the scrutiny should be there. And we know that the New York Times and Washington Post know the name, and they, we know that they name whistleblowers all the time. Um, we know that they know the name because they know who it is. They already reported all yeah. but the name. Um, we know that they identify whistleblowers all the time. It's actually kind of considered good practice if you truly don't want retaliation. So if you are a whistleblower and you're not named, you can get fired and your person can go, oh, I didn't know they were the whistleblower. So naming is not necessarily at odds with whistleblower protection. Sure. Frequently is not. Um, but yeah, it's just crazy. Like we should probably know more about this central player in an effort to remove a president. Yeah. Uh, Molly, we're running out of time. Okay. What yes. has been your favorite part of this interview? Oh, I, I, I'm I, not very good at answering best of questions. What, Molly, we're running out of time. What has been your least favorite part of this interview? <laughs> Being asked to name favorite things. No, I'm really glad we did this because we've actually been wanting to do this for a very long time. Um, and so I'm glad to actually be able to do this in person and I hope we can do it again. You are welcome.